Hello and welcome to this tutorial on Hess's Law. Now the first thing I always ask my students is why do we use Hess's Law? What's the point of it? Or what does it help us achieve? <laughs> and uh, very few can answer that question. So let's address that straight away shall we? Here I have written the equation showing the formation of ethanol from its constituent elements. So this equation represents the enthalpy change of formation of ethanol. So always check the definitions in your own textbook or with your own specification that are specific to your exam board. But usually the definition for the enthalpy change of formation is the enthalpy change that takes place when one mole of a substance or compound is formed from its constituent elements with everything in its standard state. So that means um, the physical state that these substances will be in um, under standard conditions. So again, double check the version that you're getting in your own textbook. But uh, standard conditions, um, it means standard pressure, which is um, 100 kilopascals or one atmosphere, and that standard temperature is typically 298 Kelvin, 25 degrees C. So the way to think about this is you, um, you just say, if I had some ethanol in the room with me now, very nice, um, then would it be a solid liquid or gas? Of course it would be a liquid. Similarly, oxygen in the room with me now, well of course I have that. It's a gas, hydrogen is a gas, and carbon is a solid. And again, some of the exam boards, they expect you to um, state that carbon, the solid form of carbon is graphite. Graphite is the standard state rather than diamond. And this whole subject of energetics, um, energy changes in chemistry, you really have to um, be clear on your definitions because they will guide you in all of the calculations. So for example, um, enthalpy change. The enthalpy change is the energy exchanged um, with the surroundings as heat at constant pressure. So um, that means, for example, if you were reacting um, Let's say you were reacting some magnesium, dropped a piece of magnesium ribbon into some sulfuric acid, dilute sulfuric acid, and you get magnesium sulfate plus hydrogen gas. This, of course, is used to demonstrate the squeaky pop test. If you did this in an open test tube, so you get your bubbles of hydrogen gas, the energy released to the surroundings as heat, that would be the enthalpy change. It's at constant pressure in the sense that we're allowing the hydrogen gas to escape, so the pressure is not building up in there. But if, on the other hand, we did this in a sealed vessel, so let's imagine I put a bung in the test tube, so it had to be a very strong test tube, so I don't advise you do this, of course then the hydrogen gas that's produced is not allowed to escape to the surroundings so the pressure in there builds up okay eventually the bung might pop out but the pressure is building up so under those conditions the energy release is heat is not um, the enthalpy change in fact it's the internal energy but you don't need to know that but you just need to know the definition don't ever forget when you give the definition of enthalpy change it's the energy um, exchange with the surroundings, so it's given out if it's um, exothermic, taken in if it's endothermic, under conditions of constant pressure. Okay, so, right. So, this particular reaction then, I would say to a student, how, how would you measure the enthalpy change for this reaction? It is exothermic. How do you measure the energy released as heat when carbon, hydrogen and oxygen combine to make ethanol and um, students come up with all kinds of suggestions but they invariably they miss the point that you cannot control this reaction. You cannot control the reaction of hydrogen, oxygen and carbon no matter what proportions you mix them in so that they make ethanol. As soon as the oxygen and the hydrogen um, are given the activation energy they need 
you will get um, water, the squeaky pop test of course. Similarly, oxygen and carbon will invariably react to give CO2 or maybe CO if there's not enough oxygen. But if you try to react these elements, if you started the reaction any way you like to provide the activation energy, there's no way you would make ethanol. You would make carbon dioxide and, and water. You might get a bit of um, a carbon monoxide. So it's really it's impossible to set up this reaction so that it proceeds as we've written it in this equation. So we can't measure the enthalpy change. So Hess's law, it's used to measure the enthalpy changes of chemical reactions that are essentially impossible to measure um, by experimental techniques. Now, while we're considering enthalpy change of formation, I'd just like to show you a little helpful way of writing the equation for an enthalpy change of formation. The way I recommend you do this is you start off by writing the chemical formula of the compound that you're making, the compound for which you're writing the equation for the enthalpy change of formation. So I've written on the right hand side ethanol and I'm not going to touch that and that's because the definition is for the formation of one mole. And then you simply go through the elements that you need in here. So let's consider the carbon first of all. I need some carbon and it comes just as um, carbon atoms if you like. We can write it as a graphite. And we need two of them, so I need two. Next element, let's consider hydrogen. We need some hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen atoms, the standard state of hydrogen is H2 and it's a gas. So that's how it must be supplied. To get six hydrogen atoms, we need three of those. And then we need some oxygen. And the standard state of oxygen comes as O2 molecules as a gas. And if I say we're not allowed to change it now, we can't put balancing numbers in front of this. It forces me to put half of an O2 there. So I'm not going to run the mistake of forgetting that it has to be one mole on this side and be tempted to double everything so that I get rid of that half. So that's the way I recommend you write uh, equations for the enthalpy change of formation of substance. Just write the formula of the substance or the compound on the right hand side and then leave it alone and just do everything on the left. For the exams you will be expected to know Hess's law, so you must learn it as it's defined by your own examination board, by your specification. It will be something along the lines of this one which I'm reading from an OCR textbook. It says Hess's law states that if a reaction can take place by more than one route and the initial and final conditions are the same, the total enthalpy change is the same for each route. So what that's saying is that for a, a particular reaction, let's say it's reactants A going to products B, there is a, uh, a particular enthalpy change and if you can find an alternative route to get from A to B then the enthalpy change will still be the same. So a good example of that is when a catalyst is used, you learn at GCSE for example that um, a catalyst uh, provides an alternative pathway or an alternative route uh, for a reaction to take place uh, with a lower activation energy, but the overall enthalpy change for the reaction doesn't change. Now I find um, this analogy I have here from geography is a nice way to understand this. I've written down three market towns, Aylesbury and Chesham in Buckinghamshire and then just over the border Tame in Oxfordshire. And the numbers in brackets are the heights above sea level and um, we can consider the change in height above sea level if we go from one town to another. So supposing I travel from Aylesbury to Tame, then in Aylesbury I'm 93 metres above sea level, but in Tame I'm only 72. So my elevation, if you like, has fallen by 21 metres. So you can think of that as um, a chemical reaction um, and it's exothermic because I'm losing 21 kilojoules per mole. Now, imagine that there is a roadblock and I'm not able to um, take the direct route, route from Aylesbury to Tame and I have to take a detour 
and I choose to go via Chesham. Now I know this is quite a, a long detail, but I can go up to Chesham and then down to Ten. And um, if I go from Aylesbury to Chesham, well Chesham is 147 metres above sea level, so I'm gaining height, I'm gaining 54 metres. But then when I go from Chesham to Tame, I'm losing 75 metres. But overall, when I arrive at Tame, how I got there is irrelevant. Whether I went directly or via Chesham, I'm still 21 metres. I've, I've still lost 21 metres uh, relative to when I started in Aylesbury. And this is exactly what we do when we use Hess's law for uh, chemical reactions. We have a chemical reaction that it's not possible to measure the enthalpy change directly, so we have we take an alternative route, and as long as we start and finish in the same place, the overall enthalpy change will be the same. I can show you exactly the same uh, principle using this graph. So on the y-axis we have uh, height above sea level in metres, so you can think of that as being enthalpy. So if I go from Aylesbury, which um, I said was 93 metres above sea level, down to Tame, then I'm losing a height of 21 metres. So now it looks like an energy level diagram for an exothermic um, reaction. But um, supposing that road um, were blocked and uh, I had to go to Chesham. Well, Chesham is up at um, 147, so it's somewhere up here. So I'll just put Chesham up there. And so, first of all, go up to Chesham, and that's going up. 54 metres and then I come down to Tame and I'm losing 75 metres but again the, um, the total difference is the same okay the enthalpy change from here to here is still 21 metres, I've had to go up 54 and come down 75. So that's really what Hess's law is all about. Um, you want to get from A to B, but that route is unavailable for whatever reason. Here it's because the road is blocked. In, um, in, in chemistry it's likely because you cannot measure that reaction directly. You, it's impossible to do it experimentally. You cannot um, control the reaction as we saw with the enthalpy of formation of ethanol. So you have to find an alternative route, but as long as you start and finish in the same places, then you, um, the total energy change is the same, enthalpy change is the same. Now we're ready to look at um, some actual examples of chemical reactions where we're measuring the enthalpy changes, um, or calculating them using Hess's law. So for a general reaction, going from products to reactants, we're looking for the enthalpy change and I usually write it like this above the reaction arrow with a question mark and just a little r to say it's a chemical reaction, I'm not specifying what type of reaction it is. So this is the reaction for which we cannot measure the enthalpy change directly. So this is like trying to get from Aylesbury to Tame when there's a roadblock, so we'd have to take a different route and so you would have down here uh, this would be Chesham, of course, in the analogy using the towns. But we're going to take this alternative route. Now, instead of having the elevations above or below sea level, we're going to have the enthalpy changes for particular reactions. And there are two types of data that you may be given to carry out these calculations. Uh, one would be enthalpy change of combustion data, or you may be given enthalpy change of formation values. And the type of data or values that you're given will determine how you set this out. 
and it's a very common mistake that people sort of memorise a template and they plug these numbers in but they've memorised the wrong template so they're using the template that's for combustion values or the template that's for change of formation values in the wrong situation and that's because they've been shown how to do this without really understanding what they're doing so I'm going to um, really make that clear and emphasize it to you the very first thing that you do is you say to yourself not the chemical reaction for which you're working out the enthalpy change but the, the the actual data the data that you're given is it enthalpy change of combustion or is it enthalpy change of formation values what confuses people is that this reaction may well be an enthalpy change of formation and so people automatically follow the procedure for enthalpy change of formation values when in fact, they've been given enthalpy change of combustion values. So let me show you a, a really um, good example of this. It's one from one of the textbooks. I'm going to, um, the reaction we're interested in is the enthalpy change of formation for propane. So um, there is propane. And I'm not going to ch touch that in balancing the equation. So I say I need some carbon. Carbon comes as a solid, and I need three carbon atoms, and I need some hydrogen. Hydrogen comes as H2 gas, and I'm going to make a bit more room there, but you can see that I need four of them. So I need four H2 gas molecules. Now, supposing you were... Um, given that equation and asked to calculate the enthalpy change using Hess's law with the values that I'm going to show you here. So you're usually given these in a table. So we're given the enthalpy change of combustion for um, carbon, hydrogen and propane. So make sure you know these definitions. Um, the enthalpy change of combustion is the um, enthalpy change that takes place when one mole of a substance undergoes complete combustion in the presence of oxygen um, all products and reactants in the standard state, something along those lines. But the point is, the data that I'm given to carry out this calculation is enthalpy change of combustion data. So that's going to determine how I go about setting out my reaction. The fact that this is an enthalpy change of formation reaction, I'm not going to let that um, make me go down the wrong path here. So what you do is your, you have a box down here, and I always tell people to write it as products of combustion box. And what we're going to do is we're going to combust the propane, we're going to combust the hydrogen, and we're going to combust the carbon. Now the enthalpy change for the combustion of carbon I will remind you, was 394 kilojoules per mole. I'll just write it down there. Delta H C equals minus 394 kilojoules mole to the minus 1. So remember, enthalpy changes of combustion are always exothermic. But we've got three carbons. So if I combust um, carbon, the equation for this one is 1 carbon plus O2 gives me CO2. But I've got three carbons, so it's going to be three carbons, three lots of O2 gives me three lots of CO2. So if I burn those three carbons, combust them completely in oxygen, I'm going to get three lots of CO2. I don't need to write the oxygen in, in this, um, but I'm going to have, if it was just one mole of carbon it would be 393 but I've got to do it to get from here to here the carbons from here to into this box I've got to do that three times so the enthalpy change there would be 3 times minus 394 uh, kilojoules per mole so that becomes minus 1182 kilojoules per mole okay and to get all of the reactants into that box, I've got to do the same thing for the hydrogen. And the enthalpy change of combustion for hydrogen is um, minus 286. 
minus 286 kilojoules mole to the minus 1. So that's for the reaction of one mole of hydrogen reacting with O2, and it would be half of an O2 going to H2O. Again, the definition is for the combustion of one mole of this, so I mustn't balance this equation by doubling everything to get rid of that half. That is the equation. But you see I've got four of those, so it's going to be four lots of minus 286. So it's going to be four times minus 286. And that's going to be minus 1144 kilojoules mole to the minus one. So what I'm going to do is just clean that up a little bit, make it a bit less cluttered. Let's think about what we've done here. What we've said is to, if we've got three carbon atoms and four hydrogen molecules, or three moles of carbon, I should say, and four moles of H2, if we were to get, to get them into this box, to combust them completely, then that would be accompanied by the release of minus 1182 and minus 1144 kilojoules of mole. That's how much energy would be released. So that's like going from one town to another. Um, it's exothermic, so it's not really like going from Aylesbury to Chesham. That would be uphill. This is, this is going downhill. We can do the same thing here for um, the propane. And the enthalpy change for its combustion is minus... 2219 kilojoules mole to minus 1. If I write the equation here, it's C3H8 plus O2. Got three carbons, so it's going to give three CO2s. Eight hydrogens, it's going to give four H2Os. And I can work out how many oxygens I need. I've got six oxygens in three CO2s and four oxygens in four. Water, so that's 10 oxygen atoms, so I need 5 O2s. But notice how the products of the complete combustion of propane, 3 CO2 and 4 H2O, are the same as the products for the combustion of the reactants in this reaction. And that, of course, is because it's a balanced equation. Um, we've got three carbons on this side, three on this side, um, eight hydrogens here, eight hydrogens here. So if you completely combust everything on this side, or you completely combust everything on this side, you will get the same number of moles of CO2 and H2O. The fact that they're joined together in different ways, it doesn't change that fact. So that's why we're able to do this. This is a common link. This is like going from um, Aylesbury to Tame, sorry, to Chesham to Tame. That has a common link with the products, and it's got a link with the reactants. And because we've only got one of the propanes, the enthalpy change here, is minus 2219 kilojoules mole to minus 1. So we've got the enthalpy change for each leg of the journey. What I'm going to do just before finishing the calculation is just emphasize again that in this particular calculation, although the reaction for whose enthalpy change we're calculating is an enthalpy change of formation, we're setting this out as a calculation for using the products of combustion. I'll show you in a moment how we set this out if you're given data that's enthalpy change of formation. So we, the best way to avoid making those mis a mistake and going about this the wrong way is to draw a box and write underneath it products of combustion. Okay, and that way you uh, know what you're doing. Now, this is the master stroke that I tell people to do and not everybody bothers doing it. They try to do it in the head or all on the calculator and the sooner they stop doing that and take this advice, the sooner they get these right 100% of the time. Um, don't memorize the directions of these arrows. It's obvious if these are, the arrows are going from whatever you're burning to the products of combustion. We all know that what for an enthalpy change of combustion of carbon, it's carbon going to CO2. For hydrogen, it's H2 going to H2O. And for propane, it's going in this direction. So don't try and memorise this as you would a photograph. You just write the directions of the arrows down from what you know. Then you take a different coloured pen. And I say when you're practising this, do it in red. And just show the route that you actually want to take. 
we want to go from these reactants to these products via this detail. In the exams you might do that, um, well you'd have to do it in your, in your, in your black pen of course, but um, when you're practicing please use a different coloured pen to emphasise this fact. And another thing that you do is you put arrows on the journey, on, on, the, on the route like this, because what we're interested in is the direction in which we are going relative to the directions of these enthalpy change of combustion values. So what I'm going to do is just make a little bit of space here now and uh, show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to break the journey up into two parts. Section A is going from the, the reactants to the combustion products and leg B is going from the combustion products up to the um, propane. Now for A we look at the enthalpy change and um, these arrows are pointing in the same direction. Now I would do this with a highlighter. I normally take a yellow highlighter and in people's notes I just highlight that arrow and that arrow and that arrow. They're all pointing in the same direction. That means that these signs stay the same. So the enthalpy change for going this leg of the journey, leg A, is minus 1182 and also minus 1144. We're keeping the sign the same because these arrows are all pointing in the same direction. And that becomes minus 2326. I'm not going to bother with units just at the moment. And then you do the same thing over here for leg B of the journey. And again, what I would do is with a highlighter, I would highlight this arrow and highlight this arrow. And you see they're going in the opposite directions. That means that we have to change this sign. So it becomes plus 2219. It makes sense really. If this is if this minus 2219 kilojoules per mole going from propane to the products of its combustion, if that's exothermic by 2219 kilojoules per mole, then going in the other direction would be endothermic by the same amount of energy. So it's rather like, imagine you're at the top of a hill and you cycle down, you go down on your bicycle and you lose 2219 metres. Okay. To go back up again, you're gaining that amount. Or you could think of it as gravitational potential energy. When you come down the hill, you're um, losing 2219 kilojoules of gravitational potential energy. So if you want to go back up the hill, you've got to put in that amount of energy. Okay, so, uh, so now it's just a simple matter of uh, totaling these two. I'll do it in a different colour. So the total, or the overall, if you like, it's just going to be plus 2219 and minus 2326. And a lot of people have difficulty dealing with um, positive and negative numbers, adding them up and taking them away. Um, look at these two numbers. We've got 2326. That's bigger than 2219. So that's the minus number. Is going, so we're going to end up with a minus number when we, when we add these together. It's minus 107, by the way. And um, let me just show you simple way to think about that because I know some people who are not doing maths they do have problems with this. Imagine you're on the ground and um, going down 2326 it's like you're going down a mine shaft. You go down a hole so you've gone down 2326 meters. So this is this is the uh, ground level. So you've gone down 2326 and then you um, you come up with some ladders you go up and these ladders only take you up let's say 2219 so plus 2219 so the position that you're at now is you're still below ground level so you're actually minus 109 meters Sorry, 107 metres. So you've got 107 metres to go. 
So that means the enthalpy change for our reaction, which was the enthalpy change of formation, if I write it here now, it was the enthalpy change of formation for propanone. It equals minus 107 kilojoules mole to minus 1. So again, I'll just say it one more time that um, this was the reaction that we were interested in was an enthalpy change of formation reaction, but the data that we were using happened to be an enthalpy change of combustion reaction. And what I'm going to show you now is an example of the other type of calculation where you are using enthalpy change of formation data. In this example, the reaction we are looking at is between ammonia and oxygen, giving nitrogen, monoxide and water. And again, I've written above the reaction arrow, delta H R for the reaction, and a question mark to remind me that that's the one that we're looking for. And again, I've shown that uh, we cannot measure this enthalpy change directly, so I'll put a roadblock there. Now, in this case, the data, the values that we have been given, are enthalpy change of formation values. Okay, so that's going to dictate how I set out my calculation. Now, with enthalpy change of formation values, do always take a note of the, um, the state symbols. Um, for oxygen, because um, it's an element in its standard state, then by definition, the enthalpy change of its formation will be zero. But if that were not its standard state, then we would have a value over here to consider. Right. So having noticed that we're using enthalpy change of formation values, then the box that I put down here is called an elements box. And again, I strongly recommend you just write that down because it will stop you from um, making silly mistakes and, and going about this the wrong way. Um, so we're going to put in here all of the elements and these elements are going to be used to make either the products or they could be used to make either or, or the, um, the reactants. And um, let, let's look at the enthalpy change of formation for uh, the uh, ammonia, first of all. So ammonia is NH3, and I write that down first of all, and I look, first of all I need some nitrogen. Well, nitrogen comes as N2 gas in its standard state. Um, I need only one nitrogen atom, so it's going to be half of an N2. Hydrogen comes as H2 gas and I need um, three hydrogen atoms, so that's going to be one and a half of these. So remember, I'm not allowed to multiply these up to get rid of the fractions because I have to have just one mole of the compound that I'm making. And the enthalpy change of formation for ammonia is minus 46, um, yeah, minus 46 kilojoules mole to the minus one. And so, if I'm going to make four ammonias, then I've got to multiply that by four. So that's going to be minus 184 kilojoules per mole. So I can write the um, elements in the box here. Now, instead of half of an N2, I'm going to need two N2 molecules to make, to provide the four nitrogen atoms to make the um, Ammonia, so it's going to be, in fact, it's going to be two lots of N2 plus six H2s give me um, four NH3s. So I can put in my elements box two nitrogens and six H2 molecules. And the enthalpy change for making the ammonia is going to be four times this value, which is um, minus 184. Now, to get five molecules of oxygen, I just need five molecules of oxygen um, because it's an element in its standard state. 
So I just put that there. And of course, the enthalpy change from going from this to this is just zero. And then we can do the same thing for the um, for the products. So what we're saying really is we've got two nitrogen molecules, six hydrogen molecules, and five oxygen molecules. We can either use those elements to make um, four ammonias and five oxygen molecules, or we can use them to make uh, four nitrogen monoxides and six water molecules, um, but the elements are going to be the same. So for nitrogen monoxide, um, the enthalpy change of formation of NO is, um, let me have a look, it's 90. So um, enthalpy change of formation of NO equals plus 90 kilojoules mole to the minus 1. And that would be for this reaction, so I write my NO over here. I'm making only one of them, so I need um, half of an N2 again. And I need some oxygen. That has to come as oxygen in its standard state, which is O2 as the gas. But I need half of it. And to make four of those, so I want to make four lots of nitrogen monoxide, I would need two O2 molecules and I would need two N2 molecules. Okay, And whereas this would be plus 90, if I'm doing it four times, the enthalpy change here would be plus 360 kilojoules per mole. So I can write that on this arrow. The enthalpy change for making four moles of NO is plus 360 kilojoules mole to the minus one. But I've also got to make some water. I'll leave that reaction down there for the time being. The enthalpy change of formation of water, the equation, again I just write H2O, I'll make a bit more room there, write H2O on the right hand side as a liquid and I need some hydrogen that comes as H2 gas and um, I need some oxygen that has to come as O2 molecules as a gas and I need one oxygen atom so I need half and the enthalpy change for that is minus 286 kilojoules mole to minus one but you see I'm making six of these so I need six H2s I need three O2s, half times six, and that would give me six H2Os. So I've got to multiply the minus 286 by six, which gives me a minus 1716 kilojoules per mole. So I get six times the energy released. So I can write that on this arrow now, so it's going to be minus 1716 kilojoules mole to minus one. Just tidy this up a little bit. But I hope you can see that um, the elements that I need, I need two N2s which I have here, I need six H2s which I have here, and altogether I need five molecules of O2 which I have here. So again, it just reflects the fact that we've got a balanced equation, so you've got the same elements in the reactants as in the products, they're just joined together in a similar way. So you can start off with these elements in the standard states and you can choose to make either four ammonias and five oxygens, or you could choose to make four NOs and six H2Os. So in fact, you don't even need to bother writing these in here, you could just write in here elements box, just elements. And as long as you multiply the enthalpy change of formation for each of the substances or the compounds from uh, by the appropriate number, everything will work out fine. So that's a, a quicker way of doing it. Now, again, this is the important thing. You, um, you take a different coloured pen and you just mark out the journey that you want to take. So this is the because I cannot take the direct route between Aylesbury and Tame, I've got to come down to Chesham, and then from Chesham back up to Tame, or, well, actually back down in that case. Um, but the 
journey's got two sections, section A and section B. And I work out the nth we change for each section. So over here, section A. I can see, I've got an enthalpy change value for this, but I notice using my marker pen, my highlighter, that these arrows are going in the opposite direction. So I must change that to plus 184. So the enthalpy change for sec section A is plus 184 kilojoules per mole. Section B, I've got some values, but I check my arrows, highlight them, and they're both going in the same direction as the reactions for which I have the enthalpy changes of, so I don't need to change the signs. So for section B of my journey, it's plus 360 and minus 1716. So I've got to take the sum of those, and that comes to minus 1356. Now again, some people have problems with um, adding together a positive number and a negative number. Just think of this as your bank account. You start off with nothing in your bank account. You put £360 in. So you have £360 in, in the black. If you go and spend £1,716, then your balance will be overdrawn to the tune of 1,356. It would be minus 1,356 in your bank account. So that's the way to think about it. And then you just take the, um, the, the, the overall change, if you like, in enthalpy the total and we've got plus 184 so again you put 184 pounds in your bank account but you go and spend 1356 so that leaves you um, with a balance of minus 1172 or you can think of it as a mining analogy um, you go down a mine shaft 1356 meters you come back up the ladders by 184 you end up 1172 meters below the ground. So the enthalpy change for this reaction then is um, delta H for our reaction is minus 1172 kilojoules mole to the minus one. I'm just going to run through one more example. Um, it's the enthalpy change for the formation of ethanol. Now I've not put the state symbols in here, but they should be there, but I don't want the page to get too cluttered. Um, but again, um, it's not possible to measure this directly by experimentation, so we have to construct an enthalpy cycle based on Hess's law. And the, the values that I'm given, the data that I've been given, they are enthalpy change of combustion values. So although that's an enthalpy change of formation reaction, that's essentially irrelevant. What matters, what determines how I go about my calculation, is that we are given enthalpy change of combustion values. So I'm going to have a products of combustion box. So I'll put down here products of combustion. In fact, that's all you need to do. You don't even need to write in there the right number of CO2s and um, H2Os. But obviously that's going to be combusted to get into the box. You can combust the carbon. You can combust the hydrogens. Now, oxygen itself, you still have to put an arrow showing it going into the box, but um, it doesn't have an enthalpy change of combustion because oxygen is oxygen. Um, it would come out in the balancing of the equations. Now I will show you how that works out, um, but you don't actually need to do that for yourself to be able to do the calculation. So first of all then I'll show you the simplest possible way of doing this calculation and then I'll just do a little bit showing you how the oxygens all balance out just to convince you that it's fine to do it this way. But again, the really important thing is, because we're doing an enthalpy change, uh, we're using enthalpy change of combustion data, then we have to have a product of combustion box and everything's going to come into that box. Whereas when it was enthalpy change of formation data, we were starting with the elements and making the different substances. 
So again, the enthalpy change of combustion of carbon was um, 394, so it's minus 394, but we've got two, two carbons to combust, so it's going to be two of those, so it's going to be minus 788. Okay. Again, I'll, I'll leave in, I'm leaving the units office, I just don't want it to get too crowded on here. And similarly, if we were to combust one mole of hydrogen, the enthalpy change is minus 286. But I see that we've got three of them, so we must multiply it by three. And that would give minus 858. And we just ignore the oxygen, that's just balancing up the oxygen on this side really. And then if we were to combust a mole of ethanol, it would be minus 1367 kilojoules. And then I take my pen to indicate the route that I would like to take. I want to come from my reactants into the box and up to the products. And I put these arrows on and I call that section A of my journey and that's section B of my journey. And then I just look at the enthalpy change for each section of the journey. Being very careful about the sign. So for section A of my journey, first of all, I notice that I'm going in the same direction as the reactions for which these enthalpy changes apply. So I keep the signs the same. So it's going to be minus 788 for the carbons and minus. 8, 5, 8 for the hydrogens, so that becomes minus 1, 6, 4, 6. Again, you can think of that as your bank account it starts off on zero balance, you remove £788, and then you remove another £858, so your balance then is minus 1,646. I do the same thing over here for section B of my journey. And again, I use a highlighter to indicate that I'm going in the opposite direction for which these enthalpy changes apply, or this enthalpy change applies. So I must write that as being plus 1367. So the overall change is going to be minus 1646, and it's going to be plus 1367. So the, minus, the negative number is larger than the positive number, so now I'm going to get a minus value. Again, I, it's as though I've taken 1,646 out of the bank account, but um, I've put in only 1,367, so I'm down to the tune of 279. So the enthalpy change for this reaction, um, delta H, and I'll put it as a an F for formation, that's what it is, of ethanol equals minus 279 kilojoules mole to the minus one. So that's the simplest possible way of going about such a calculation. You don't need to write out all the individual reactions for the combustion reactions and um, you don't need to put a value in for the oxygen. But um, I'm just going to do this again but in a bit more detail just to convince you that that is the case. I'm first of all going to work out what I would get if I combust two carbons. So I've got two carbons and um, I need two lots of O2 and it would give me two molecules of carbon dioxide. So the carbons would give me two lots of CO2. Okay. And I've needed to use two molecules of O2 in that combustion reaction. Okay. And combustion of hydrogen, again, it's um, for one mole of hydrogen, it would be half of an O2 to give a H2O. Remember the enthalpy change of combustion is for the combustion of one mole of the substance. But I've got three hydrogens, so I have to put a three there. 
So I have to multiply um, that by 3 and that would give me 1.5 oxygens and it would give me 3 lots of H2. So um, if I combust 3 molecules of hydrogen I would get three molecules of H2O, so I'll put that in the box. And um, I'm just going to put the extra oxygen, well the oxygen that I need all together is um, two plus one and a half, that's three and a half O2 molecules. But I've also got that half up there to think about. Now if I do the same thing for the combustion of um, ethanol, I'll just fit it in here, um, one mole of ethanol, it's got two carbons, so it's going to give me two CO2, and it's got um, six hydrogens, which is enough to make three H2Os. And then I look at how many oxygens that I need to combust one mole of um, ethanol. Two carbon dioxides, that's four oxygen atoms. I've got three waters, so that's three oxygen atoms. And um, so that's seven oxygen atoms altogether, seven oxygen atoms that I need. I've already got one provided in here, so if I just add three H, sorry, three oxygens, three O2s, so I've got three O2s. That's a balanced equation now because I've got six oxygens plus one is seven, and that balances the seven oxygens I've got in the products. So altogether, I need three, and this half in here just corresponds to this half up here. So another way of thinking about that is that to combust the two carbons and the three H2 molecules, all together I've needed three and a half molecules of O2, two for the carbon, one and a half for the H2, three H2s. I've needed three and a half, but I've already got one there, so all I've needed to do is add on this side um, three, three H2s. If I've got that lot, then to get that lot into the box, all I need to do is to add three lots of O2. With the oxygen that I've already got, the one oxygen atom, if you like, the half of an O2, that's three and a half, which corresponds to this side. And the same on this side. To get the um, ethanol into this box, if you like, to fully combust it, I just need to add three molecules of O2. Again, I need seven oxygens for the products, but one of the oxygens is coming from in here, just like this oxygen is coming from here. So you don't need to worry about that for yourselves, just be reassured that you basically ignore the oxygen and um, if you want to try balancing all the reactions out, it does all work out very nicely. So it's only the enthalpy changes for the combustible substances that you um, need to worry about and you can just do a, uh, a products of combustion box. Uh, okay, well I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much.